All right, so today we're going to be discussing chapter 12, section 1, which deals with types of mixtures. And mixtures are all over nature, some less obvious than others. For example, uh, a pile of dirt has, you know, clumps of rocks or maybe some twigs or whatever in it. Or let's say you have a glass of milk. Now, you may think that's just one material, but actually within the milk, if you take a sample, you'll see that there are little fat proteins that are irregularly sparse apart along with maybe some random cells and whatnot from the cow. Or you take something like salt water, and if you look at the sample of salt water, you'll see that sparse among the water molecules Almost equally, there are sodium and chlorine ions. Now, these types of mixtures all have different names, and we're going to be discussing those within this video. Now, for the most part, uh, mixtures can be categorized into two different varieties, and those varieties are what are known as heterogeneous mixtures, genius with an E right there, and homogeneous mixtures. Now, as you may have already guessed from the roots, heterogeneous mixtures are things that are uh, a mix of various objects, but not in a very uniform way. For example, this pile of dirt and the milk would be heterogeneous because, you know, there may be more rocks over here than there are over here, or more fat proteins, or what have you. However, homogeneous have a sort of even distribution within the whole solution. So for example, within this salt water, so I'll just label that salt water, there is pretty much an even distribution of sodium and chlorine ions throughout. There's no point where you can distinguishably say, hey, there's a high concentration of sodium versus the other side of the glass. And this happens because things like sugar, and salt, which I'm sure you know from experience, dissolve in water, are what, is, what are known as soluble compounds. That is, when you put in, let's say, a sugar cube or something, and mix it up, the molecules of water will slowly chip away at the sugar and take away the individual sugar molecules from the crystal until you have a distribution like this, where it's completely even throughout the mixture, and there's no discernible uh, evidence that there's a high versus low concentration of sugar bias throughout the mixture. And when you dissolve some sort of soluble compound, you get what is known as a solution. And a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances that are in a single phase. And this basically means that they're thoroughly mixed enough to the point where there's no discernible uh, differences within the mixture. Everything is sort of the same composition and has the same properties throughout the mixture. So now just to go over some vocabulary, if we blow up this picture of salt water just a little bit, you'll remember we have you know some chlorine ions and some sodium ions floating around in a solution of water. Now within this mixture of salt and water, there are two components. One is known as the solvent, and the other is known as the solute. Now, the solute is, in general, what gets dissolved, that is, what there's less of. So, you couldn't put half water and half salt and expect to dissolve all the salt. So, the salt, in this case, would be the solute, and the water would be the solvent, that is, what does the dissolving? And in a solution like this, uh, the solute and the solvent are very thoroughly mixed. For example, you could pour this you know, through some filter paper and it would drip down out the bottom and you would still have salt water like this because they are mixed even to an atomic level that uh, all the things would be able to pass through the filter paper without being caught up. 
Now solutions can exist in all three main phases of, ga of uh, matter. For example, our atmosphere is a solution of oxygen, which is the solute, in nitrogen, which is the solvent, because it's about 80% nitrogen, our atmosphere is. Liquids, we've already discussed, you have the salt water. And there are also solid solutions. For example, brass is not an elemental metal, rather it's a mix of zinc and copper, which when combined are stronger than the two constituent metal. Another type of mixture are what are known as suspensions. Now suspensions tend to have much larger particles than solutions. Uh, about a thousand times larger and up. Now suspensions you can think of would be like muddy water where if you stir it you can get a pretty good mixture however eventually gravity will pull all the particles down to the bottom and you'll end up with a cup with some dirt down here at the bottom. Or also orange juice that's why they tell you to shake it well. You can end up with all the pulp down here and predictably if you pour it through say a coffee filter the solvent or well, I guess it's not a solvent because it's not a solution but the water or whatever you're using will go through the filter however the dirt and rocks or pulp or what have you will get caught up in the filter because they can't make it through on a molecular level so if you were to actually do such a thing as uh, create muddy water, stir it up, and then let the dirt settle to the bottom as I have depicted here. You'd still notice that the water in this section of the cup would be cloudy and that's because it still contains particles that uh, mix enough, mix well enough within the water to sort of disperse and counteract the force of gravity. However, not enough to uh, completely dissolve within the water. And these particles are in what is known as the dispersed phase. That is, they're dispersed throughout the water. And the water, in this case, would be the dispersing agent. That is, the solvent-like material that allows the particles of dust and what have you to remain within the, the uh, mixture. Now, colloids, like dirty water, or milk all exhibit something known as the Tyndall effect. Now the Tyndall effect has to do with light and mixtures. So if you have let's say some salt water, we'll just draw some various molecules in there, and you shine a beam of light through it onto a wall, let's say that's right here, and here is the source of the light you know, shining. You won't actually be able to see the light passing through here. You will only see it once the light gets through to the other side. So the light sort of just passes through unimpeded. However, if instead you have a colloid mixture, like say muddy water or milk or something of the sort, then what will happen is that the light well, you know, head for the mixture, and a lot of it will pass through to the other side. However, it will also collide with all these particles in here, scattering the light, which makes it visible and allows the mixture to sort of glow because the light from this beam will scatter off of all of the little particles in there, and so the light beam will be able to be seen from all directions. And this is true of all colloids, including things like smoke in the air. That's why you can see, you know, a sunbeam in a dusty room is because of this effect. The small particles of dust scatter the light and allow you to see where the actual beam is going. Now we're going to be moving back to solutes to talk about the difference between electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Now both of these substances are solutes, that is, they can be dissolved in water. However, electrolytes are usually ionic or, you know, very polar substances that can conduct an electric current, which has the symbol I, uh, within 
a solution. So for example, if you had a beaker full of water and you put in some salt, what happens is that the salt breaks up into its sodium ions, which I have put in here, as well as its chlorine ions. It's no longer NaCl, it's Na dissolved and, Ca and Cl dissolved, rather. And these cations and anions uh, allow a current to be passed through because the charges are mobile. This is also true of compounds like HCl, which are not ionic but are very polar. And they, when dissolved, will form hydronium plus and Cl minus. Again, because these form cations and anions, they're able to conduct a current and by uh, putting wires in here or some sort of probes of some kind and hooking up a circuit, you can test whether or not a solute is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. Now, non-electrolytes are simply solutes that don't conduct electricity. For example, if you have a solution with some sugar in it, the sugar is just a molecular compound. It's not ionic or superpolar. So it won't break up into mobile charges like the uh, hydrogen chloride or the sodium chloride will. The sugar will just sort of uh, remain dissolved and if you put two electrodes in there won't be any current that will pass through. So it's non-conducting and therefore a non-electrolyte.